Hello and welcome to the Automotive Anecdotes podcast from Automotive Tales, your regular chat about all things on four wheels that your other friends don't want you to talk about. here with your regular hosts John at John MSM on all social media platforms and I'm Martin at Bob Clayton probably on Instagram and I've forgotten where else I live we are joined in series one with our two uh, regular guests for the series they will be joining us for all five episodes of our inaugural run yeah that one (laughs) I'm Chris Norton and uh, at underscore Chris Norton underscore catchy uh, on Instagram Nice and easy. And I'm Greg Coles at the Yorkshire Engineer. Uh, only on the one channel because I'm boring like that. But uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's on Twitter. On oh, Twitter. Yeah. Twitter on that one. On the Twitter. Perfect. Fantastic. Well, before we start, it's probably important that we give you a bit of an idea about the format of our first series of automotive anecdotes. We're going to have uh, a very simple discussion. There will be a subject for each episode, and we will finish every episode with a fantastic game called Barge Bingo. More on that later. Uh, John, what's today's podcast topic? So today's podcast is grinding gears. So we want to talk about all the things that really bug you. It's going to be like, uh, it's going to be like therapy. We're going to get all those annoyances out on the table, thrash them out and either agree, disagree or generally row about it. Perfect. Sounds like a plan to me. And this will probably give away what sort of cars we've owned in the past as well from the from that in- interesting uh, topic point. But before we start, let's get the listeners up to speed with what type of car balls we each are with a simple question. Uh, and I think we'll start at the beginning, at the first episode, with your first car. Greg, what was your first car? Well, interesting. Um, I, I sort of bounced between two cars initially. So my first car that I actually owned was a rescued Rover Metro, uh, 1.1 litre engine. I took it on as a project, resurrected it from the dead, and that did me well for sort of 60,000 miles. On the side of that, I was battling around in my mum's Rover 200, experimenting as you do, making best use of that uh, 103 brake horsepower from that. 103 brake horsepower? Yes. All of it. Okay, there's the starting point there. So 103 to beat. So, <laughs> so you're a, you started your car life in the, Briti- in the capable hands of British Leyland. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, you know, Rover Finest, Rover Finest, you know, growing up in Yorkshire, everybody had a Montego on the drive from Austin or, you know, a Rover Metro or something like that. Uh, you know, having a Rover 75 was a posh thing for our neighbour. So, uh, yeah, that's where I started. Oh, I mean, I was going to say it's only really up from there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, yeah, as, 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 as the owner of at least two British motorbikes as well, so I'll probably stay British for a while. Uh, this, this, this is a four-wheel podcast? Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, two, you know. two wheels, definitely not allowed here, but uh, but I also run bikes, so uh, we'll have to compete on that one later. I might, I might be out of but here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Chris, you just said there, it's only up from here, so let's see where you're going to take us, your first car. Oh, I meant for him, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I actually kind of have two first cars there's there's a, a bit of a oh yeah but if you consider this so basically um i didn't learn to drive until i was 20 well i didn't pass my test until i was 23 so i actually had a car should, should we really have him on the podcast oh yeah sense. sorry uh, I'll just take the door yes, and we're really pleased that you're here on your 23rd birthday <laughs> yes, a... exactly <laughs> congratulations here's a green key <laughs> luckily the listeners can't see my face to uh, know any different from that <laughs> But um, yeah, so technically my first car, it was a Suzuki SJ, um, mm. which I got when I was 16 with the deluded dreams of putting it on the road when I was 17. Um, and it actually belonged to uh, my granddad who gave it to me uh, for free. It was a complete wreck. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, there is actually a upcoming Automotive Tales series indeed video 
Stay uh, tuned to the Automotive Tales YouTube channel. Uh, if you're not following it, it's at Automotive Tales on all social media platforms. This is going to be a fantastic race to see which one comes out first, the video or the podcast. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. a good point. <laughs> okay, so, is it, is, so you got it running at 17? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I got it running... Uh, I got it on the road last year. <laughs> Brilliant. So, so uh, how many years was that then? Without, um, we're going to give away your age here, of course. But Many. Uh, so <laughs> it worked out about 14? Yeah, it's about it? 14 years yeah, wow. since I had it. Does so, saying that John's BM Cabriolet is not far behind that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> shh, shh, that's, that's my dirty secret. We don't talk about the dirty secret. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, that would be a good topic for a, a future podcast, actually. The, what, what is your dirty secret? Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about... The, the project that's squirreled away somewhere that hasn't seen the light of day for about 10 years, covered in dust, and uh, you've, you've got all the bits, but they're also stashed away in the cupboard, and mm. one day you'll get around to it. <laughs> so was the, was the SJ something that you had to just keep going back to, or was it, what 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 caused the delay? <laughs> <laughs> Incompetence, mainly. All oh, right. <laughs> no. so, so basically, um, I, I got it when I was in college, and I wanted to put it on the road. I did actually have that many skills it was the first car I had and what I wanted to learn how to, to work on cars with uh, and yeah life got in the way I went away to uni um, et cetera, et cetera. then uh, when I started my job over in Warwickshire I brought it over there with the view of right now is the time to crack on with it and then subsequently got distracted for several years on other projects <laughs> brilliant so, so that was the first car you owned what's the first car you actually drove on the road so <laughs> Um, the the first car that I actually had on the road as my car, which I guess I consider what most you know that's how most people define their first car. Yeah. <laughs> a normal person might describe their first car as the first car that they had when they passed the test and they were driving around it, uh, and that was a Volvo three forty. Oh, um, another yes. Volvo fan. Yeah, <laughs> an, another I didn't Volvo tell you about this. I'm snuck <laughs> another Volvo fan in. Yeah, apologies for that. Um, yeah, it's it's quite an unusual car. It's a saloon as well, which is much we less had common. One. We had one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're they decent cars actually. They're a they're a weird blend of um, Volvo, DAF, and Renault, all <laughs> I mean, coming together. What a mixing into pot a, that is. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. All <it's>, marks <laughs> of reliability going on in certain corners. Like. But sir, but sir, yeah. It's, it's certainly a tank design because we had a head-on smasher one, interestingly, when I was younger. Right. Um, mm. Five of us in the car at a combined speed of 120, 60, 60 oh, head-on, oh, wow. and they rebuilt the Volvo. <laughs> 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 so, wow, yeah, okay. It was definitely an interesting collaboration. With so we're they don't know what they hit. We're saying so they, to be, yeah. Yeah, they haven't found the other car that was hit. But it, was, so, it was an XR2i, it just went somewhere in a head. Yeah. <laughs> we punted into out of space. So Volvo were responsible for building it then, we can say that bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, technically, yeah. I think the engines were Renault DAF. Right. The engine. Yeah, the, yeah, basically Renault engines and electrics, I think, which is not a good combination. <laughs> uh, well, on either of those, really. The, it, it was originally a... Um, well, the the powertrain originally was DAF because it actually harks back to those Vario cars that they built in, what, the late 60s? Yeah, Variomatics, they were very yeah. good, actually. Mm. Yeah, and, and bizarrely, the Volvo 340 is a bit of an oddball because it has the engine in the front, the clutch just behind that, then the 340 actually just has a long aluminium prop shaft, yes, it not, not a torque tube. Um, and then the gearbox and the diff is in the back. It's an aluminium the body. prop shaft. Yeah, yeah, because it's running at engine speed, not not gearbox speed. Yeah. So it has to be quite lightweight for the to not so destroy it, the seat. It's rack. like a Porsche. It has a transaxle with a gearbox uh, at the back. Yeah, I mean, you can tell yourself that every night to help you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then at the back, it so it has all this this kind of sophisticated uh, layout, you know, whatever. Uh, and then it has this uh, leaf sprung de Dion axle at the back. Oh yes, it's 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 a really bizarre arrangement, but it's actually it's okay. Um, but yeah, that that was my first car. It was uh, rear wheel drive, not powerful enough to kill me, um, and also not powerful enough to insure, and completely off the radar of anyone young. 
that will have crashed them, so the insurance wasn't too bad. <laughs> were you base back 1.4? Oh, uh, one point seven. Ooh, yeah, the saloons ooh. only came with the one point seven. Yeah. Presumably, because the one point four. One point four nonsense. No, 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 one point seven liters. I'll have you know. Ironically, the, a lot of people say the one point four is a better engine anyway. The one point seven is quite clackety. It's not a nice engine at all. <laughs> so did you did you buy this? Was it, was I bought this it? with my own money. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> and actual money. It's so, beige, <laughs> gold, or something. It's all white. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So what happened to it? Did you did you keep it? Did you sell? it on what's did you make did you turn it over for profit <laughs> did i turn it over for profit no i actually still have it um oh, wow yeah. okay so i still have both of my first cars Amazing. um the the volvo is suffering a similar fate at the moment to the suzuki it's sort of squirreled away in the corner but um yeah i'm it, now seeing a photo of it showing me oh yeah that's yeah uh, oh it looks pretty photo. smart oh yeah it's it's very tidy yeah it was owned by this old boy who was into um he was into restoring, I don't know what the proper name for it is, but uh, they're, they're effectively push bikes with tiny little engines on. Right. And he was into buying these vintage ones and doing them. Oh, like, like Pedal and Pops type of thing. Yeah, yeah, Pops. that kind of thing. And he had a shed full of them. It's, it's the four, it was the forerunner to probably the, the modern electric bike, the electric assist. Right. They yeah. used a petrol engine to assist the bike. That yes. kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose, just going back to your first car as well, Greg, because we didn't ask, but obviously Metro's famed for being long-lasting and reliable. Oh, so yeah. where, is yours still in the garage now? No, or? no, no. Mine's, mine's long disappeared into a part of us somewhere. Uh, no. probably, the biggest, probably the biggest challenge of that car, really, to rebuild it was it was a big MOT failure, partly because it had been thrashed by its previous owner. That's why it did. The engine was spot on. The engine gearbox is brilliant. You know, I put sixty thousand on it. Was well up into six figures. That was that was cracking, but it was just rotting around me, unfortunately. In true, uh, didn't you actually <laughs> trade it in though for more than you paid for it? And yeah, 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 yeah. I did actually. I managed to. So I traded it in for the infamous Fiat Brava. After that, one point nine TD one hundred, uh, which interestingly was the one car that everybody ribbed me for buying the Italian, but outlasted everybody else's car. Was the most reliable of the lot. Perfect. Didn't, you, didn't you even get flooded in Manchester and then put uh, back on the road? Yeah, you got flooded, blew the head gasket, blew the starter motor, three foot of water, down a country road, in fact, it was Staffordshire on a, in the floods. M- most people would have just given up at that point. Mm. Drained it, emptied it, put a head gasket on it, which was a ball lake on that car, uh, <laughs> got it started, and it went on to do nearly 200,000 miles before somebody ran into the back of it. Wow. <laughs> Job done. Amazing. Yeah. So... John, very briefly then, I suppose we can also say about our first car. Yeah, go on, Martin, uh, you start first. So, I here, I have a confession here, um, and despite, and it's a good job you mentioned that people can't see us, but despite my looks, <laughs> I think I'm the youngest round the table. So I passed my driving test in 2011, um, <coughs> <laughs> because I was bored in the 90s. <laughs> uh, still before um, me. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, you were born in the 90s. I, I quit. Born That's it. I'm done. That's <laughs> um, so, as a, uh, I, I actually got a motorbike license before a car license. So, hey. technically, my first vehicle. <laughs> I told you. Two wheels. <laughs> no. Four wheel pocket. My first <laughs> full vehicle was a Yamaha um, XJ6. Uh, but, if we which at least it shares a car name, uh, mm. but it wasn't a Jag. Um, my first car was actually Italian. I had a Fiat Stilo. Um, Ooh, and it's as boring Italian as you can get. <laughs> Even Greg's going to get 1.6 dynamic five door. It wasn't petrol. even a good looking was petrol. It, oh, was it dynamic though? Um, it was dynamic in the sense that the stereo was good. Uh, it had dynamic base. Dynamic uh, <laughs> it, it had. It was dynamic in a supermarket car park because it had parking sensors. Um, but... It was actually, you know what, it, it, it was a car that when all my other cars after that failed, I kept on a driveway and you'd come back and you'd put a jump pack on it and it would go again. Um, and the only thing I ever had to do with it was change a coil pack. So it cost about 40 quid in the time I had it. That's, so that's not bad to be fair. <laughs> I sat here looking at a microwave which has got more styling than that. <laughs> I will not deny that as the five door as well, it was not a pretty car yeah. and it was, it was not pretty inside. But I found a friend who sold me a five CD changer for the glove box, and it, for fancy. Fancy. <laughs> it was worth more than the rest There's of the car. car. Sick um, ice install, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It did its job as a first but, car. But you have to wonder how they went from the Fiat Bravo, which I had, which was a nice curvy bit of Italian flair, European car of the year in '96, I think it was '97, 
to the Steelo. Yeah, it's um, mm. it it was it was an interesting, it, particularly because uh, at the time there was still, I mean, the, the weird thing was there was a factory line somewhere that was still making barquettas and stilos alongside each other, and there was a man there with a clipboard going, "Those are both good." So, <laughs> so something, something went wrong. wrong. <laughs> the weird thing is because, and okay, maybe you'll be in the same position when you learn to drive, but. I learned to drive, um, going on a tangent a little bit, but I learned to drive in a, in a new Mini Countryman diesel yeah. with start-stop. So I went from driving a diesel car where you could hold the clutch on the hill, and if you stalled it, you just put your foot on the clutch again and it restarted. Easiest yeah. driving test ever. No, I didn't stall it. I'm just saving fuel. Um, to, <laughs> to, 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 to then yeah. getting a Fiat Stilo, which... You know, was using a 15-year-old, well, not 15-year-old, it was 10 years old at the time, a 10-year-old clutch that had definitely never been changed. And, you know, it, it meant that there was some lovely little flare, you know, it, it had some characteristics like, you know, I'm pretty sure auxiliary belts are supposed to sc scream uh, that, you know, in yeah, the cold, that's just yeah, what yeah, they do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you've got to heat up somehow. For anybody that's not a proper car boy, it's, it's got character. It's just yeah, another that's... byword for it. Shit. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I've got issues. Exactly. But so, so mine's mine's actually pretty boring in that sense. Mine was probably the definition of modern Eurobox. Um, but but John, presumably you're going to outdo us all here straight away we'll with down your down. first car. Yeah. Fire away. No. Yes. So my first car is is you know you, you've got to start somewhere and work your way up, right? Um. <laughs> So my first car was a 1998 Vauxhall Corsa. And that ends the Automotive Anecdote <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> podcast. Yeah, I'm sad now. Uh, it was a uh, one litre, 12 valve, a little three cylinder Daihatsu engine, I think it was. And I'm, I'm going to cover over my notes here. I reckon Greg can tell you what the number plate is because he's got a bit of an eidetic memory for these yeah. things. That was, uh, would have been S319 AFA. That's the one, right. S319 AFA. Well, I've actually checked if it's still there. I was going to say, if it's still in existence, yeah. someone's listened to that and gone, oh no. You're the moron <laughs> that did that and this and the other. So it was a perfectly bog standard car when I got it. Um, being a bit older than you, Martin, I was, you know, Max Power was actually cool when, when you know, I wow. learned to drive. <laughs> That's a subjective comment. It was indeed. Um, so, you know, it may have been adorned with. Uh, out with the radio because it only had didn't even have a cassette player as standard it was just a radio AM FM radio uh, so that was ditched for a Sony CD player no less uh, oh Greg's looked it up um, MOT expired in 2009 oh, oh, well. <laughs> it soldiered on it's, it soldiered on for a little bit yeah um, and yeah so we put in oh we I put in you know uh, 6.9s and then a, and then a false floor went <laughs> in the boot and then oh, the, yeah. there was an amplifier and then some crossovers and some a pair of subwoofers and then some tweeters and some extra speakers and, and the wheels and then the wheels yeah and the neon mm. the blue neon we can we don't we talk about that <laughs> <We're just laughs> shut up <laughs> were you a chap <laughs> <laughs> no comment oh this is a um, sign to I might be able to out. swoop into your rescue there John talking of, of Max Power and, <laughs> and confessions oh, to Mech I, I think I think yeah you probably you probably do you know where I'm going with it yeah. yes I think I do you know, I've I've got a confession to make dear viewers um, I, I'm actually uh, listeners uh, uh, dear <laughs> listeners viewers whatever <laughs> other platforms are available <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a bit of a confession to make um, I uh, you may have seen doing the rounds online it was it was a little bit viral at one point a couple of years ago but. Um, I have a BMW E36 Compact and I was stupid enough, just for fun, to put an Escort Cosworth wing on the back of it and someone <laughs> took a photo of it and it went literally viral around the internet and that you would not believe how many people were extremely angered by this, um, as you might imagine, especially the sort of forward fraternity. Um, it upset a lot of people. <laughs> I'm sure there were a lot of people that were looking for Cosworth wings to like, you know, <laughs> actually restore their Cosworth, and they're going, "That's where they've gone." Yeah, someone's got hold of that. <laughs> Put it on a BMW. Yeah. Uh, oh wow. So, so did they ever trace it back to you? You say it went viral. <laughs> did they? Well, did they track you down? I got tagged in it quite a lot. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> Like, uh, this is the moron. We know who it is. But I, I did never receive a lynching in person. Fair enough. 
So I, th- I think the irony with the Corsa was, with the addition of the subs and the amplifiers, the fact he had to keep the engine revs up at the traffic lights to stop it stalling, the addition of the alloy wheels just put too much torque on the engine, it needed more it revs to get started. Yes, and exactly. he'd added more weight. We went from 0 to 60 in 16 seconds to about 0 to 60 in 20 <laughs> seconds. I, I would point out, uh, in, in my favour, things things went uphill uh, very very quickly after that. The mayor Dumbler is kicking your ass in the metro. Uh, yeah, the yeah. Can, field. can I ask a question about three cylinder courses here? Because my memory, I had friends that had sort of the same generation, sort of 98, 99 courses. Cor- yes, Corsa B, mm. uh, which is another bugbear of the fact that we couldn't have Corsa, Corsa A. We had yeah, to Nova. Nova. But, um, the, you could always tell the basic spec towards the um, the upgraded models by the steering wheel because the entry level model didn't have an airbag, so it just had yep. a central small central spoke. I drove but, a, a death spec, no airbag. That's fair. <laughs> so that my friend as well, and the one vivid memory I have of these three some of the courses, and he mentioned it's it slightly steering there. wheel going through his face. No, they, they just would never start. They were they were. It took, it took it was such an effort to get that three cylinder unit going yeah. and it shouldn't be because I, it, there's so little to it it should just be like you should light a match I think, just, I think the camp position sense I think was a problem in mine it was completely intermittent I think it was quite a yeah. common fault but I think they used, the used quite a heavy flywheel on them haven't they because yeah, the first it, of the three three mm-hmm. cylinder generations and to smooth out the engine to stop it being lumpy obviously technology's moved on now with three cylinders but just for Vauxhall, who were actually probably ahead of their time. You actually think yeah. about it compared to 4DK boost and everything else. Yeah, it's like a pre road to Little Liga with its three-cylinder. Because they were doing that engine at the same time that uh, the VAG group were doing the HTP, High Torque Performance three-cylinder engine. And that engine my mum actually still has in her Fabia. That's soldering around at this field at the moment. <laughs> but that's a very similar engine. You've got to almost like wind the engine you've up. You've got to wind it up. Yeah, with the course, you could pull away without, with barely, it, well, when it was working, you didn't really need revs to pull away because there was so much weight in that flywheel, so much momentum yeah. in the flywheel. It's, it's just a weird, vivid memory, but I, I don't yeah. there. Yeah, what I can't, it's an interesting memory. When I first had it, when I got mm-hmm. to university, a friend of mine had, uh, same year, but he had the 1.2... <sighs> But it was 1.28 valve with a four-speed gearbox. So I had a, I had a five-speed gearbox, and I had a twin cam three-cylinder. And I can tell you, the performance of the two was absolutely identical. I can't explain how we know this, but I can tell you that they are absolutely identical. And a, a random little digression is uh, when I realised this was a horrendous car after my first year of university, I went and got a summer job had a, a few pennies to spend and decided to upgrade quite significantly. I went from three cylinders to six cylinders and I, and I bought myself a bit of very rusty but a very beautiful uh, BMW E28 520i. It's a uh, lovely machine in Zinnabar Red. And we came back after the summer holidays and I, I turned up at our university's motor club in my BMW feeling like the Mac Daddy. Uh, and my friend turned up in his little Corsa B 1.2 and I looked and I was like... I think we know who's faster now. And he's like, yep, me. And I was like, yeah, come on, mate, this is a two litre inline six. It's a German work of art. And he just popped the bonnet. And I was like, yeah, it's a, it's a 1.2 Corsa. And as he lifted the bonnet, uh, my jaw hit the floor because over the summer holiday, he'd managed to wedge in a two litre XE from the Astra GTE yeah. into the front of this little Corsa. To this day, that is probably the most violent accelerating car I've ever been in. <laughs> and he actually did the kind of Cobra test. He put a five pound note on the dashboard and pinned it. He said, if you can get that before we hit the motorway down the slip road, you can keep it. And I couldn't. Yeah. Brilliant. So I think we can confirm from all of that that uh, uh, not that the points matter in these kind of discussions, but at the moment, Chris is one nil up because all three of our first cars no longer exist. That's a very good oh, so point. so yeah. fair play. Even even the modern day Stilos couldn't couldn't outmatch uh, your first car. So um, so I think that, I, I say that was, that was an opening point. But, yeah, um, we've, we've always had a full length. We've always had a full length. Let's do like yeah. two minutes on the I, on the subject yeah, and then move on. I, I think we can say that all the engines are warmed up and we're now at cruising speed. Um, <laughs> so going on to the main conversation point for episode one, that was grinding your gears. Uh, we just thought it would be a really interesting conversation to talk about what are those things in, uh, whether it be modern cars or just things that have been there for so long now in, in, in car design, that really grind your gears. I mean, who would like to start? Who's, I'm, uh... I'm actually going to start because I had a really good point ready set up for this. Um, and with most of the things I tend to have a bit of a rant about, I've, I'm actually a massive hypocrite because I've gone full circle in the last 24 hours on this point. So my first point I was going to put down when we talked about doing this podcast was M1 motorway roadworks. <laughs> <laughs> so the roadworks where you hit it, it's 50 mile an hour, and uh, I mean, we went down to London last weekend, 
23 miles. Mm-hmm. We had 23 exactly. miles of continuous so, 50 miles. So at the time of, of recording, we're saying junction 14 to 16 is what we're talking about there. Milton uh, Keynes to uh, yeah, above I think so, yeah. Okay. Can I just um, interject there? And just extend it to the M1 motorway in general. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a fair it, point. It is awful and suitable for I nobody. I, can I interject even further? I spent two years commuting, including the M5, down to Bristol to Grimsby in my one of my previous jobs. And I think in total I did 63 miles of 50 mile an hour road. Oh, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> that was going to be my gripe uh, until uh, we went down to London last week. Uh, and they've upped it to 60, which they is have. actually a bit more civilised, mm. so I've given, given that. Yeah. But, <clears throat> as of yesterday, I'm actually a big fan of the 60 mile an hour cruising speed on the M1. Oh, because yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know what's I going on. Yeah. So, uh, we may have been lucky enough to go to an event, and there's a, well, the video would have gone out long before this, because it's busy rendering as we speak. Um, an event in London at Hampton Court Palace. Um, and we decided it was a good excuse to get the Duchess out and give her a good run. Uh, so with 6.75 litres worth of V8, 60 mile an hour is actually a really good speed for not, you know, needing a new I'm mortgage. Underrated. Yeah, underrated. And very underrated <laughs> speed, exactly. Uh, and I discovered that it's great because people don't get annoyed when you're wafting along at 60 no. miles an hour because it looks like you're doing a speed limit. You're not actually trying to be a tight Yorkshireman and save money on fuel because... Yeah. Well, we, we we won't talk about how much money it costs to drive it to London and back yesterday. So we were saying that the, the Rolls Royce had, should have a tagline of "not to sixty miles an hour." Full stop. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I've never taken above sixty because I can't afford to. No. Um, right. So yeah, so I had I had a really strong point in that, and then I've gone full circle. Oh, actually, I, I, uh, I quite like the sixty miles an hour. It's quite good. Hmm. Yeah, because you don't feel pressured to do something exactly, and it, it, it's one of the most relaxing drives. So much so. Um, we left Hampton Court Palace and drove all the way back to the Midlands, to Loughborough, without stopping because we, there was no need to stop. It was just a nice, gentle you just cruise. just waft home. Yeah, so it, it wafting is just a arrive back home. And, oh, yes, they did a journey. And, and as those of you that arrived this morning at, at our studio will notice it's, uh, it's abandoned on the driveway. We got <laughs> literally <laughs> abandoned. It does look like it's peeking around the corner to see if it can make it nearer to the house for you, sir. Yes. But it's... Uh, <laughs> So, so have you got a current bugbear that you'd like to replace that with? Is that what you're saying? I'm going to go with another another kind of road related as opposed to cars. And I think it's probably speed bumps. So I'm going to interject oh, yeah. a mm. controversial view here at this point. Is I actually don't mind speed cameras. I would, But with this context here, I'd rather have a speed camera over a speed bump. You don't mind a speed camera because you're doing 60. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not relevant. I, I hate speed bumps with a vengeance. Um, because they're just pointless and they damage cars. I think it probably stems from when I had a, a VW Sirocco, and every time you went over a speed bump, you either took the exhaust off, uh, took the sump off, or you compressed your spine in a really hideous way, mm-hmm. which was you know, my own doing because I lowered it within an inch of its life uh, on coilovers that were so stiff it was effectively without suspension. But I, I've grown this massive disdain for speed bumps. So you'll know the feeling of coming across a, a particularly steep one and having to cross it at 45 degrees. And <laughs> yes, and hoping it doesn't lift one yeah. wheel and you're going off the other side and you lose all traction. But you know what? It's funny you say that because it's. Um, I'm thinking about a car that I had up until last year, which is a really mundane car, but for, for, for a bit of context, I do about 40,000 miles a year on motorways. So for me, an automatic car that wafts is quite fine, but more than 60, please. Um, yeah, and, and more than 10 miles per gallon. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I had a Skoda Superb estate with its... What, what do you think of that car? Was it... Um... Uh, it was all right. Um, <laughs> was that <laughs> superb? I genuinely think it was superb. However, it was um, a, a sort of, it was like a mid, mid-spec mid one, and it meant that it came on the 17-inch alloys, the sort of normal run-of-the-mill alloys for the Skoda range at that time. But they were quite small in comparison to the car, and the, it meant that if you got to... So not just speed bumps, but how do you explain those ones that aren't fully across the road? They sort of put oh, the humps little, little jump, yeah, yeah, around yeah. in the middle. Yeah. So it would go straight over them, but then it would always, the back exhaust box would always hit them because it's sat so <laughs> low. And I, I had it checked and it was just, no, it's just a low car because the dog needs to get in and out the back apparently. Yeah. But it meant that you were just constantly scraping in a family estate. And I'm not sure that was the only reason it was low the back. I've seen you drive across a field piled high with... Um, 
with band equipment yes, and I mean, going over some bumps and it very much grinding out and taking I'm, part of the field with it. I mean, that, that's a separate conversation. <laughs> but yes, not just speed bumps, but the fact they're replacing them with those sort of little mounds in the middle of the road and then cars are getting wider and it's fine if you've got a 4x4 four four or, you know, a, yeah. a Nissan... Those Range Rover just go boom, straight yeah, over. Yeah, but, you, you know, all these sort of jacked up cars are fine, but it means that, you know, it's the people that like their cars that are suffering. Mm. Uh, so I think we Classics. should we should probably have to work on that. Well, yeah. those uh, those little humps in the middle of the road are actually particularly painful for me because my, although I have a 4x4, the Suzuki is extremely narrow uh, and it's not wide enough to straddle them. <laughs> so everyone else wonders why you're slowing right down for these things. It's because they're actually quite savage in that. <laughs> and, and especially on its... Uh, kind of turn of the century um, or turn of the last century leaf springs. It's yes. it's it's pretty awful going over those. <laughs> Definitely, it's a bone shaker at the best of times. Yeah, exactly. And actually, some of them can be quite severe in the middle or towards the edges. Whereas, yeah, most cars just straddle over them and you gotcha. just about catch them with the wheels. But yeah, yeah this you know, they're they're like little mounds in the middle of the road for me. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. No, it's interesting because I, I do agree to a certain point. I think the only place I would probably argue against you is I think the only place that really valid is outside places like schools. I think that's yeah. where you should really slow down. But mm. I do, I do, I do. Think, I guess my other pet hate that it's something I haven't actually put down. But these speed cameras, if they're going to be speed cameras, though, they have to be almost average speed cameras if they're over that place mm. rather than individual items. Because I have a massive pet hatred of the muppets you find on the motorway who come, or in a town anyway, who come along, slam on for the camera. But then again, you get the stupid idiots who do it for average speed cameras. <laughs> yeah. So, which, which bit of your schooling did you miss of average, the mean, you know? <laughs> not the speed up and the slow bloody down. I think you expect far too much of the general public. Oh, but this is this goes into oh, yeah. actually one of my points. It dovetails quite well. It's people's failure to keep a constant speed on the motorway. Yes. I had it coming here today. I'm on cruise control, tumbling down the A46 dual carriageway. And somebody comes past me, and this is the bit that really gets me. It's not those that you catch up. It's those who come past you, pull in, and then let off the accelerator. So then you're automatically catching them up. Mm -hmm. Why? Just <laughs> yes. keep yeah. a constant <clears throat> speed. My, my bugbear with that, because I completely 100% agree with you, is if you're going down a three-lane motorway, and they'll be sat in the middle lane, because they always are, and you go to overtake them, and as you get alongside them, you suddenly realise you're not making any progress anymore. Because they're yeah. accelerated. Yeah, and you just think, well, now I've got to look like oh. a muppet and pull back in. Yeah. Oh. And that ties into the lazy gits <laughs> on the motorway <laughs> who will <Well -controlled>. <laughs> sit in the middle lane because they can't be bothered to flick a little indicator, pull out onto the outside and get past the slow-moving traffic. Yeah. So they'll slow down to 60, wait behind the wagon, and then speed up to 80. But by this point, you've all had to pull out because you can actually be bothered to drive. Get in the outside lane, go past them and pull back in. It's like, stop being lazy. This is great. Get it's a long out. time since I've seen Greg so animated. Get in, <laughs> yeah. keep going, constant speed. Because all you're doing is slowing everything up behind you, causing traffic and slowing everybody down. Now, it must be said, that must be a massive bugbear in your, I won't give away your exact geographical area, but let's. there are a lot of two-lane Oh, uh, just two chat. carriageways in that area, so it must be a proper annoyance. Yeah, and talking about saving time as well, and I'll go to my next point here. HGVs. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> oh, right. I know where this is going. <laughs> right. I get it, but simple math says you can only drive for four and a half hours, there or thereabouts. It's four, four and a half hours max. Oh, before a tacker break. Before you have to take a tacker break. Realistically, you're not going to get a length of motorway where you're going to be doing 56 mile an hour for four hours. Therefore, while you're overtaking each other, by half a mile an hour, if that, are you going to spend 15 miles trying to get past each other? Brilliant. You've gained about two minutes on your coffee break, <laughs> right? Yet every bugger behind you who has had to slow down from 70 to 56, don't worry about them. who They've lost five minutes of their journey, and that's the hundreds of cars behind you. But you managed to sit side by side for 15 miles holding everybody up. <coughs> so we can rule truckers out of our listening group. Uh, oh, no, I, 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 I get it. Snail racing. <laughs> I, I get it. You know, I've seen it. I get, I get loads. I get going uphill. My, my old brother drives, drives wagons, stuff like that. I get it. If you've got a clear distinction, but if you get alongside a wagon and you have not passed it within two or three miles tops, you need to get back in. Yeah. Because yeah. I followed one the other day on a dash cam, and I went back and had a look. It was 16 minutes on the A1 for you to pass each other. That is just selfish. That's ridiculous. End of. Yeah. 
So thinking about that, and, and uh, tell me your thoughts on this, and I'm going to ask for your thoughts rather than moan about it, just in case we do get a... Suddenly we find that HGV drivers are listening. <laughs> so the same argument, but in those 50 mile an hour averages, where 56 still seems to be the speed that lorry drivers want to do, does anyone else feel really sort of vulnerable? If you're going through those, and they come right up behind yeah, you, yeah. and almost, I've had it before where they're flashing you, and you think, well, I'm, I'm trying to be a good citizen here, doing 50 mm -hmm. mile an hour, but lorry drivers, I don't know whether it's just cameras don't fix them, or get them, I don't know what, but is anyone having experience I, I guess, I'm guessing what they're doing is they're banking, and I might be wrong here, but my view is, I'm, I wonder if they're banking against the 10% plus two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which and is their speed yeah. limiter. Therefore, the 57 mile an hour is where they think, so if they hit that 55, 56, yeah. Uh, and some of them are 50 miles an hour for fuel saving. I know companies like Sainsbury they think run 50 mile an hour on their wagons, but uh, they're, they're bang up just under the cusp. Therefore, they're relying on the fact they'll get away with it. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Understood. But well, it is still it's still intimidating. Yeah. It's uh, it's still a valid a valid bugbear. But um, okay. No, that's good. Uh, Chris. Well, uh, so I, I'm going to steer slightly away from um, I guess motorways, although that was one of my my pre-prescribed rants, but I think we've we've had a good old rant about <laughs> motorways now and got yeah, it out of our system. <laughs> Greg looks like he's had therapy. Look at you, I'm so much happier on this. This is what it's for. I've yeah. got two points left. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the fact that anyone's listening is just a bonus, really. It yeah. is really, yeah. yeah. We slowly really. alienated every part of the listening group. Yeah. HGV drivers, help. yeah. So who should we cross off next? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, this is a might seem a strange one I guess in some ways but um, have you guys come across the built not bought sticker on a car and the I guess the kind of car that that goes on sometimes just it, I find it irritating because I've never had one of those <laughs> okay John, John is already alienated as well, <laughs> along with the HGV driver so to me built not bought means that you physically built your car from the ground up. So in, in my head, that kind of applies to um, a kit car, um, something like a hot rod or a custom car that you have- you've Significant done, changes. Yeah, you, you, you just... you've started with something and you've built your own car, your your kind of version of that. You may, yeah, like you say, you've customized it as you've gone. Um, so you, perhaps you did start with a box of course or whatever, but it is, it, it's, it's no longer really a Vauxhall Corsa. It's been modified in a number of ways. You know, it has a different engine, different, you know, everything. Um, but when you see that kind of sticker on a kind of slightly modified Ford Fiesta, <laughs> so, okay, you've, you've lowered it a little bit. Uh, you've put a body kit on and you've tinted the windows. So and that's your not even build. a weekend's work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to, it, it, to be fair, I have to. Mine was on uh, uh, old BMW E twenty eight M five three five, which wasn't so much modified, but we did an awful lot. We stripped out the interior, took all the sound deadening out, stripped the wiring loom down, took the ABS systems out of it, stripped most of the dashboard out, and we had a whole control panel that was push button start, um, and it was it was done for basically drag racing. So yeah. it was. It was a bit more like built, not bought, as in it yeah. was, you know, we, you know, we put bucket seats in and made all our own rails for it, put harnesses in it, um, you know, swirl pot in the boot because it was getting fuel cut and all those things. So it had fairly substantial modifications, so I'm yeah. justifying my use of that, but I fully <laughs> agree with your rant, so I'm, yeah. I'm on board with that. So were we saying that built, not bought should be used more towards a car that has been uh, adapted or changed or modified enough that it is genuinely unique. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I think that yeah. is actually a perfect way of summarising it. Is it's no longer a, a Ford Fiesta that you could just buy anywhere and within a weekend turn it into what you see before you. Yeah, I think it's it's, it's the case of like I think John alluded to there was uh, pretty much you know you can, the, 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 those modifications you can make that everybody can make and they're ten a penny. Yeah, yeah. But it's I not think, just bolting on off the shelf. Parts, I think, I think yeah. it is literally bought. I think yeah. it, I think my view is you have to, it, that has to be applied to something where you've had the vision to go to something unique. It is that one off. Yeah. It is mm. that you know what I'm going to stick. Uh, John's 6.75 litre Rolls Royce engine in a Vauxhall Corsa. Yeah. Uh, yeah just because yeah. or, or the chap in Leicester who, who stuck a there. Rolls Royce Merlin V12 well, in a Rover SD1. It wasn't, wasn't yeah. a Merlin engine. Oh, no, it's not supercharged, was it? It was the, yeah. uh, what's the tank variant of it called? Uh, Griffin, I think. 
No, yeah. the Griffin, no, the Griffin's here next engine up. Oh, Meteor. Meteor, that's it. The non supercharged. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> back in the but day, of well. practical <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah, he sits in the back seat because it comes right under the bulkhead. <laughs> there's a, there's a, uh, a gentleman in near this studio where we are right now that's got his Reliant scimitar with the Rover V8 oh, in yeah. it. Uh, that sounds lovely. That's beautiful. Uh, but he's done obviously a lot of work on that. Mind you, he's probably going to put built not bought on his tractors more than his cars. But, yeah, um, well, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the um. It's, I mean that because that's quite a specific one. There was one that I was, I'm hoping you're going to say because uh, mm -hmm. you know you, uh, let, let's let's be honest. There were some emails uh, yeah. that flew around before um, before the podcast. I did because I cuffed it. There's, <laughs> <laughs> there's one bugbear that, um, that that would have been on my list that you've got. Do you want to? Well, yeah. That? So um, I, I'm hoping this is the right one, but I'm going to have a rant about it anyway. So <laughs> at the moment, I. Um, at my place, I've got two Japanese cars. That's I've, the right one. I've, I've got a, a Lexus IST50, which is my daily. It, it's an auto. It wafts around in comfort, and, and and that's all good with me. And then I've got my Suzuki SJ, which is um, the opposite of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Literally like yeah. chalk and cheese. Yeah. But both Japanese cars. And I, I don't... I was struggling to think when this actually changed, but um, going back certainly towards like the 80s and 90s and before that Japanese cars always had the indicator stalks on the right hand side um, and, at the, and my Lexus is on the left like a normal European car and switching between the two on a daily basis is just irritating I, I, weirdly I always remember when I'm in the Suzuki but it's the right hand but when I go back to the Lexus, I am constantly turning the wipers on and just looking like a complete tit. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I forgot I've, I haven't had that issue for a while. Yeah. You know what? I had that issue up until last year because my uh, my partner, please don't criticise me for this, she had a Hyundai i10. Uh, oh, a washing machine. Yes, it was <laughs> literally a washing machine. Sometimes it ran on four cylinders, sometimes on three. And it was only a 2013 model, but like, it was built to a budget. <laughs> Can I just interject? I've had a text message from the other room that just says ergonomics with an exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> As you point out, my wife is an ergonomist. Uh, if you don't know what that is, Google it. Um, and yeah, it's a perfect uh, example of yeah. really poor ergonomics where things are different in different cars. It's still adapt. happening in <clears throat> South Korean cars. The same right. thing is still happening. I used yeah. to switch between, uh, you know, at the time I had the Skoda, but I've had every car I've had since then on the left, getting hers, windscreen wipers on. Yeah. It's still happening yeah. on Hyundai's and Kia's. But, yeah, but you could argue, are they right? Because they produce more cars than we do and their markets are driven that way. Therefore, that's why a lot of it is it's, it's cost so, savings. So they, get, they have the same rant on a podcast somewhere. <laughs> yeah, 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 there's probably some people like, this is the thing. I don't care which side it is. I just want just them to want be the, the same. same. <laughs> <laughs> no. But equally, uh, I was trying to think of this. Have have Japanese cars changed or is that just something that Lexus have done specifically to to get away to because obviously they're no, more used to I the think, US and European market. I think what they've done is if I think I did read something about this uh, and I might be parking the wrong tree, I probably am, but I believe now they've brought European factories, they're building European specs. Back in the day, uh, when you look back in the 80s, 90s, a lot of your Japanese cars came from uh, their markets. So I know the Toyota there, yeah. we had was built there, whereas now it would be built in. Is it some, where is Toyota? They're in, they're in the Midlands somewhere, are they? Oh, yeah, they're in Darby. Uh, Darby. Yeah, yeah, they're just on the road. So they will okay. build a European spec car because they're building purely for this market and no, Europe. That's what I'm over from. Rather, yeah. rather than all your cars. So our Toyota Carina 2 that we had, uh, what my parents had when I was younger, and then I came from my grandfather, that was a Japanese built car. Yeah. It was just shipped here. Yeah. Bear in mind some of our former colonies out there. Are... So it was shipped here. Is that what you said? Shipped. <laughs> okay. so, someone else. <laughs> some, and some of our for, some of our you know, some of the former countries, particularly that were under the uh under the Commonwealth back in the day, under the Empire so to speak. Um, the Empire were left yeah. were uh, left hand drive countries, so they're applicable. Yeah. I suppose it's it's probably a case as well now. We'll, we'll have to get them. Hopefully, people will sort of correct us if we're yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah. If, if you think we're talking well, BS, then do well, do an example the might be you know because even if you think about it, sort of like let's take Mitsubishi, where at the, I know they're 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 not they're they're stopping in in, in the UK yeah. soon. Yeah, they're pulling out. But, the UK and they're still imported. There is still an importer that brings them in, but they've got the Renault and Nissan ties. So does that mm -hmm. mean they've adapted to Renault or? Because as far as I know, Renaults and Nissans do are all on the left now. Yeah. Mitsubishi's are still built over there. I don't know. And let us know. But can I can I extend it a little bit further then? Because ergonomics is exactly right. Why is it? Why can't every manufacturer 
just have it that you fuel the car in the same way. <laughs> Whether that be a button, a switch, I, I can't. Then you know you get a rental car, and your biggest worry is, I, I really hope I don't look a tit at the petrol station. <laughs> like it's it, yeah, you some, some have a lever to open the cap, don't yeah, they? Some, some, some of them have button. no buttons at all. It's <laughs> yeah. Ford, yeah. Ford have their just cap, don't they? They they use the central locking. Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Central locking solenoids on yeah. fuel fillers is is actually one of and, my bugbears because. I've had two cars now where the solenoid has failed in a locked position, which is oh, really yeah. difficult when you need to fill up, when you desperately need to fill up. Yeah. But there's been an added uh, addition to that now, which is manufacturers thought, right, guys, don't worry, we have mastered fuel. What you do is it's really simple. There's a cap, and we'll, we'll give you a challenge of how you open it, but then all you do is you put the nozzle in, and you will fuel your car. And then they invented AdBlue. <laughs> and AdBlue in my car at the moment is fine because they're in the same space. They're in the same, literally the same flap. They are both there. I was speaking to my friend who has a Citroen uh, C4. Don't judge him. Um, and it's under, I have to it, wait to do that. It's, really, it's, it's under the boot. You have to go into the really? boot and open the flap where the battery is also at the back of the car. Yeah. And the AdBlue goes in there. And you think, well, why couldn't they just... If, if Vauxhall, of all people, could manage to put two nozzles in the same place, mm. then surely every car that's built on a higher budget could do the same thing. I'm still not on board with this. So we've got our first car, which is AdBlue. Uh, so we've got it just before lockdown. How so do you fuel actually... it? <laughs> Say again. Where's the fuel for it? Where do you... Oh, it goes in. It's next to the fuel for the AdBlue. Right, okay. So um, Volvo have got it right as well. Yeah, absolutely. Fine. And I, I just, I've only filled it up once. And, but it's a strange thing because, you know, you go to a petrol station, you fill your car up. And there I am stood in my yard with this bloody great big like filling up from a jerry can. You don't yeah. fill your car from a jerry can, do you? So I'm sitting there, glug, 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 in it goes. And it, you know, it gets full and it makes a bit of a mess. And you, this is ridiculous. We're 2020. Why am I filling my car up with a bloody bottle? How long does it last then? then? Uh, a long of miles. time, yeah. I've, I've, I thought, yeah. I've done about, I, I think I've had to fill it up twice in, in 15,000 miles. Yeah, so it tanks in okay. between sort of five yeah. and, yeah. and 8,000, depending but, on the uh, car. But am, I, am I allowed to continue an ergonomics rant here? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, right because I'm, I'm thinking even further now. I mean, beyond the fact that obviously no manufacturer is, apart, maybe version of iDrive is sort of a de decent interface for everything. But just the fact that cars are obviously built to a budget. So one of my bugbears is so niche that I'm sorry to everybody who doesn't own a Peugeot, a Citroen or a Vauxhall. Um, but why is it every other manufacturer, when they switch the steering wheel over, will still give you a glove box? But in a Vauxhall, a Peugeot or a Citroen, they don't move the fuse box over. So you, I tested this before I came out because it is my bugbear. You can't fit the handbook to a Vauxhall Insignia in the glove box of a Vauxhall Insignia. Really? No, <laughs> it's just because they don't move the, the fuse box over when they move the steering wheel. That's because, Martin, it's a glove box. It's for your gloves. Yes, but, but I don't think it would even hold a pair of gloves. This is my worry. <laughs> you know, to me, a glove box should hold... The handbook and service book, so I don't forget to give them to the to, to whoever's stamping it, Brilliant. and the locking wheel nut key. Now, if I put both of them in, and I can show you guys outside, my glove box is not closed properly because they're both in there. Oh, no, I haven't even brought the car in. <laughs> I can't show you. But I can show you on the courser that's outside. Sorry, there's another courser involved here. But... Um, I just, I, I just think there are so many little things like that that are sort of presumably cost-cutting measures on modern cars mm. that just grind my gears. Um, I was going to be controversial just say it's the French, but well, <laughs> it probably could be because before uh, um, strike before they bought Vauxhall, this was not a problem. So yeah. it's, a, it's a problem that's been created. It's a disease that's spreading. It, it is. It yeah. is. It's a, a glove box virus pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I'm coming into a vehicle near you. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to jump with another similar pandemic. Well, that's two that I'm I'm, I'm worried about. I'm going to go with it. Wanky number plates. There's, Say that again. I <laughs> thought you were saying something else. Later. <laughs> uh, well, it, which covers both wonky and badly spaced number plates. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Yes. So that, that, that's what that means. It's a combination of those two things. Yes. Um, so the the first bit is. Uh, well, again, I'm a hypocrite. I hate when you see a new car that's got a wonky number plate on it. You're like, it really? happens more than you think. Yeah, yeah. and I, re I realised only recently when somebody pointed out that our new car has actually got a slightly squiffy yeah. number plate on the rear. And uh, it, it made me very upset, but I'm, I'm, I'm just pretending it's not, not there. But I've seen, I've seen like Jags with, I mean, there's got to be a good four yeah. or five degrees of not straightness and it's screwed in as well. You yeah, think, yeah, and that's... somebody screwed into the car, not even got the. And let's see, let's spend fifty grand on a premium car and the car got the number plate on straight. That's my point, and it's like that's ridiculous. I, I can only imagine this is the the doing of dealers who just don't care, and they just whack a bit of tape on and just go. 
Just but, throw it at the car. And like, and I, I guess oh, it's yeah. probably part of my, my bugbear. If you're going buying a new car, I know it's all <laughs> lease and finance and stuff these days, but, but if they don't give a crap enough to at least put your number plate on straight, yeah. I kind of almost don't trust them to service the car. But you almost have to look at this. This is a highly positioned car that's made in a factory with templates. How hard is it to make a simple jig on a standard UK number plate that has two holes in the same place every time you bloody drill it? And I can Therefore, guarantee that is the first time someone's thought of that. <laughs> because they just do not care. Yeah, right. <laughs> Off to yeah. Dragon's Den then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> literally. That, that's a good idea. The UK number plate is the standard for any manufacturer. It's UK law. Uh, well, mm, unless you have one of those strange yeah, yeah. jags with the really there are some plate. there are some exceptions but you can still if jaguar can still get a template that fits in the right place knows where the two holes are on the car and goes right number plate 20 mil down each side hole actually in. maybe jaguar are onto something that there because it is effectively a self-jigging number plate it yeah, is yeah, a weird it's that recess, yeah. so yeah. it only goes in as it's intended what, what you what, what you probably find is the manufacturers who do the designs where they're trying to encompass both probably mainly for us european markets uh, they're trying to get European number plates in as well as UK number plates, so they'll build a space that will fit yeah. bigger, yeah. smaller, yeah, wider, well, shorter, taller. And same for US plates, which but, are narrow but, but slightly taller. The number plate holes are still in exactly the same place on the bodywork. Therefore, yeah. you should be able to map that back to the and number plate. Interesting odd fact about number plate spaces, and, and I'm not 100% sure it's the correct vehicle, but I think it's the Suzuki Wagon R, Wagon R Plus, because I don't know what the difference makes. They yes. have... And you know what I'm going to say? Don't yes, you? it's it's weird. It's weird. So they have a number plate recess on the bumper, yeah, yeah. and one on the yeah, boot. Yeah. So they've obviously designed different bits of different markets and just gone. Well, it's already got one on the boot for that market, but the bumper needs it for that market because maybe the boot's too high, or the bumper's too low. I don't know what yeah. the reason is. And I find it so weird. And I've seen them with the number plate in different slots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like that's so weird. You, they've given you an option. Maybe it's a, it's a thing, you know. Oh, well, with our car, you can have your number plate in two locations, don't you know? Can we uh, can we give some brownie points to Alfa Romeo for putting their number plates in a different spot to everybody else? Yeah. yeah. Being a uh, okay. Does that I get brownie can... points, or are they just being difficult? Well, I like the Italian way. <laughs> where here is a problem that didn't need solving. Yeah. Voila. <laughs> but Alfa is the only car where having your number plate there is acceptable. Discuss. Uh, um, well, I mean, are there a few Ferraris that have them in the corner like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of a crime if that's the case. But uh, you're on the SJ. Well, uh, on the SJ and the BMW, it has. Uh, I mean, uh, an uh, offset on the front. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. no, no, no real maybe, reason. Maybe we should leave that. Yeah, we just, one there. We just oh. wind that one back out of the recording, yeah, shall we? Yeah, yeah. Let's wind that yeah, one out. You can edit that out. Can, so. I, um, can I go? To, can I throw? Randomly into a piece of technology on a car though here because John's purchased this on his recent Volvo. I think it's on his recent Volvo. Is electric tailgates? Why? Why? Oh, yeah, they why are pretty you, needless. Why do you need them? I'm not being funny. For somebody who puts dogs in the car, boxes in the car, and I've got an estate, I've got a Mazda six estate. Uh, the amount of people I see in car parks who load the car up. The boot goes down. No, it doesn't like it. Sense doesn't like it. The boot goes back up. The boot <laughs> goes back down. Right, in that time, I've opened the boot, put it in, stacked the stuff, and shut the boot, and I've gone. I was, was going to say, 100% yeah. of the time I've tried, when I've raced one of these, I've beaten it. You can shut a boot with your hands quicker than any of these electric ones. Yeah. What yeah. do you think about the ones where you have to kick the car? No. Kick the bumper? Why? It's just lazy. Yeah. Now, in the time you've fallen over, <laughs> stood on one leg with lots of heavy shopping or a kid or a toddler, you could have just gone, ooh, switch, open. Is, is that now? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's controversial. I was exactly the same until we got this car. And once I'd figured out, because you're waving your foot underneath the bumper to try and get it to open, it's a bit weird. Mm. But actually it does work. There's been a few occasions where I've had all my filming kit for automotive tails. And I've got, you know, Pele case in one hand, Pele case in the other hand. And I'm well, like, you know what? Uh, you swipe your foot but why and risk? Goes, why risk lots of expensive equipment in a case stood on one leg falling over in the rain where you could just put one case on the floor because the boot, put your case back on I'm a leg. capable human being and I'm able to balance on one leg it's a skill I've, I've learned many I'll, many years ago I will wait I will wait I will wait for the day that you fall over John um, <laughs> I, I do think there's, it's just another thing to go wrong but yeah. I, another thing I do I like about it thing. on ours it's got two buttons on so when the boot's open you can push one button to close it or one button to close and lock, so you get all your shopping. You, you yeah. do the, you know the thing you do when you go shopping. What? You don't want to do two runs from the car. No, 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 no. no, no you get that. everything in one go as much as you can physically lift, and then you usually thump. And as long as the key is in your pocket, it will close and lock the car without you having to do any other but, interaction. But any, but any car does that. So my car has uh, 
keyless entry. So I walk up to it, touch the little sense switch, open the boot manually, put my stuff in, shut it, it just locks automatically if I walk away and I haven't opened the rest of the car. I don't think it has a locks automatically. Mine has a different approach again in that the boot is separate from the cabin as such. So you can walk up to the car, you can, with the key in your pocket, you can open the boot, clo- do what you want, close it, and walk away, but it never unlocks. Yeah, that's exactly the same. The car, it's exactly yeah. the same. It's yeah, so you, can, you can just open and close the boot and walk away. Yeah, it's just this is getting so beautifully niche. Yeah, this yeah is it is getting it's very niche. specific. Yeah. 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 It is, but I, I just I just watched people in the car park. I watched I walked up to somebody in Lidl the other day when I was going shopping in, and by the time I'd opened it, I put my bags in, shut it, got in the car, started it, and they were just closing the boot. It's like <laughs> you're just wasting yeah. my time. There is something very funny, and and it's happened to me many times. Where somebody's got all their stuff in their hands and they're trying to open the boot by swiping their foot underneath the bumper <laughs> and it's having none of it. <laughs> and they're just like standing there going, Go on, open you and bloody that, thing. And, and that's my point. Yeah. If the, the, yeah. the button works, every car I've had, the button works, the lock works, it just open yeah. boot, close boot. Why make it more complicated than it needs to be? So what you're saying is basically it was a problem that did not need solving at yeah, all. Because yeah. it's a problem that didn't exist. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> most things in modern cars are problems that yeah, didn't exist. Well, on the flip side of that, the one good boot thing that has happened, and it, I like the idea that you have buttons in the boot that put the seats down straight away. I like that. Yeah. Because if you're there at the back of the car trying to load something, you go, oh, it's a little bit too long. Zoop, boom, gone. Uh, I, I will point like out, that. in the Volvo 50, you can just lean forward and go click, click, and push them down. Yeah, but you see... You have to go then in the front yeah, lift the and you'd have seat to climb. Up. You'd have to climb into the car to do that in my car because I can't reach the seats in the back. So from me, I've got two little switches. It goes flat. It's lovely. Do you know our car's got a similar thing that it was a problem that didn't need solving, but I actually really like it. There's another button in the boot. You get ridiculous amount of buttons in the boot, <laughs> um, uh, which reveals the tow bar. And I mean, I've never had a problem with a car with a tow bar at the back, but actually, it, it, it's it's a really geeky thing. But you push the button, you zoop, what was the tow bar. what was so ugly about the tow bar? It had to be hidden in the first place. Well, yeah, I guess if you've got park sensors and a tow mine, bar, I don't know. Mine, but, mine worked perfectly fine. It's been on for sixty odd thousand. Yeah, I just, Wait, it hides I just, the tow bar. Yeah, it's it's underneath the bumper, that, so it fit, surely that's you just know, something else. The Rangers and Landers did it. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've learned something. Um, uh, okay. or, we, or just get a detachable tow bar where you go underneath, put a key and put a lever and drop it out. Well, yeah, I mean, XC90 had a detachable tow bar and I never bothered detaching no, it. No, no, we actually have the master stick. Because <laughs> <detachable. laughs> it was much more useful than parking sensors because when you hear thunk, you know you've hit the yeah. wall. Yeah. I'd, I'd actually rather leave the tow bar out so that if someone does reverse into you, their car you know has the damage. It's and a fantastic <laughs> deterrent if you've got people really uh, close absolutely. to the back of the car. And well. case in yeah, point, I'm somebody, somebody rear ended my brother's V70 about six, eight weeks ago. Um, in a, it was a six month old, I can't remember what it was, it was VW or something, completely totaled mm. the car that ran in the back of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and all it did is he basically wrapped his car around the tow bar yeah. and he just cracked the rear bumper. And we took the rear bumper off the V70 and there was no damage to the crash structure underneath mm. or anything. It just cracked the bumper, but it completely totaled the car that hit the back of him. So they, they, there is a benefit to having them hanging out the back. Fantastic. Well, we but we better say on behalf of uh, the V70 owner that uh, obviously your brother there. Uh, thank you to Commercial Vehicle Products for uh, helping him out there fixing that little endorsement there. Yeah, little endorsement, products, Chris. But yeah, he's, uh, he's proved a point. For me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very wary that we are definitely running quite quite yeah, long. Yeah, this, this half moment. an hour podcast so, is at 58 minutes. Perfect. So I think <laughs> we should move speedily on to the final part of the podcast. Thank you for. I know. I'm sorry. Thank you for grinding uh, many gears there. But I feel that we should probably pull over uh, at this point, point here into the hard shoulder and just have a chat about barge bingo. So absolutely, you barge. can hear everybody's like preparing their their articles because you know the phones go barge bingo. So let's explain the rules of barge bingo because it's not just for conventional barges. What we're going to do is we're going to set a challenge to our guests every uh, podcast episode to go onto Auto Trader, find they their favourite car that fits the category, and we will debate. Uh, between us who we think is the best but ultimately it, we will put them online for you to debate and discuss uh, so for our first barge bingo we set everybody the challenge of finding a car for sale uh, now the rules of this are going to remain the same they have to be runners yep. they have to be uh, completely MOT'd. legal MOT'd uh, a car uh, you can get in and drive away. Yes, exactly. Um, and the first challenge to keep it nice and easy, 
Uh, we want to look at uh, estate car. It is a car, yeah, isn't it? £5, yeah, £5,000 budget 5, for estate cars. £5,000 estate cars for sale. What have people found? I think we should probably let the guests go first. There's a few people still hurriedly scrolling. Well, yeah. now I think we should probably just point out that there are going to be some set rules to this. Three of us have done our research and have cars ready. Chris, thank you for joining us today, but you have to forfeit. Uh, Chris is going to do a live search now and find what he feels within page one of Auto Trader is his best estate car under five thousand pounds. So other we'll car leave... trading platforms are other available. car trading platforms are. Available. And if they want to sponsor us to do this section <laughs> in the future, we're we're all in. Yep, we're looking forward to the car and classic one. Uh, so I suppose on that basis, who would like to go first? I might as well because uh, yeah, let Chris go first. My it's search is done. I I promise to. Uh, uh, originally, I promised to pick the first one, and actually, the first one is uh, is what I'm going to choose. I think so. Um, this actually looks like somewhat of a bargain. It's a it's a Volkswagen Passat 2011, five thousand pounds. That's never five grand for yeah, 2011 Passat. Uh, uh, just <laughs> depreciation is a wonderful, wonderful thing if if you don't already own the car. That so, is. how many miles has that car done to be five thousand pounds? One hundred eighteen thousand miles. That's not too bad. It's surprisingly not that bad. bad. It's got DSG. Oh, it's, that's it's black. That, <laughs> that's the problem then. Yeah, is that the same point? I don't know. It looks very spacious. It looks very tidy, actually. It's got a panoramic roof. Panoramic to repair is the... Uh... It's got a panoramic roof. Auto, well, DSG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's auto thing. So I imagine that will be, on that model of that will be the six-speed wet box DSG, which... You have to watch out for clutches, but in fairness, I took mine up to 192,000 on the original gearbox. So that's not too bad going. This is a blue motion as well. Go on, read, read part of your favourite part of the advert there, Chris. Well, there isn't in much in the way that um, Auto Trader has changed. There's, there's never really like a description anymore. It's it's just a a, a list, a wish list of, a wish list, of things. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean. It's had a, a recent timing belt and water pump, gearbox Ooh. oil, all, all new brakes and pads. Um, what else has it got? A solid and reliable car that looks the business. Looks the business. <laughs> Ideal for families, Are taxi, doing business? slash chauffeur drivers, long distance trips, and it's only in commentary. Yeah. There we go. So I'm, can... I'm happy with that. There we go. Well done on your new purchase of your VW Passat. Uh... Oh, wait. I don't have to spend actual money. Do I? Ah, yes. You have to buy these. That's ah. the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, what have you got for us? <laughs> I, I've gone for something slightly different. I've been, I, had, I actually had two in my uh, inbox. I'm going to pick one out uh, here. It's a C32. Okay. Uh, Mercedes Benz. It's 4995. It's only done 130,000 miles. Uh, so it's an AMG estate. Uh, it's got full history. It's just had all its brakes done. It's just had its MOT as well. So it's got a year's MOT on it. Uh, and effectively, you're looking at a 354 brake horsepower, 155 <laughs> mile an hour <laughs> estate. Uh, and this one's pretty well spec'd as well. It's one of the reasons why I picked it out. It had uh, the double spoke AMG alloys on it. It's got two turn lever seats. It's got the inserts, the black and blue inserts it's also got the xenon headlamps put on it at the time as well with full service history so uh you know what if you want something that'll do 0 to 60 in sort of around the five second mark 155 mile an hour it's only done 130 fouls it's got a full dealer history then where would you not get a plaything like that from amazing that sounds pretty good sorry. it's 2003, 2003. and, and it's, wow. it's it's obvious with stuff like the black <laughs> and blue inserts it's had all the parking sensor spec onto it it's got all its original two-turn lever in there it's not really creased as a lever. It's obviously been very well looked after. You sound like you're on commission. Yeah. 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 Is this yeah. your car? How much, no. how much do you think someone would have paid for that new? I reckon that's probably best about the 40, 50 grand car. Wow. Possibly even more, more, more than that, more. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But then mine's just 2003, so it's 20 years ago. Yeah. But even yeah. then... Just to induce... Oh, just that's to you, you, do, you, do, you do see some of these motors around. You see them with a lot higher mileage. There was one on there I just quickly Googled that had done sort of 200,000 plus. So, you know, they're a pretty mm. robust piece of kit, really, for Mercedes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, there, well, is, there is an end. I feel, I feel like we just give up at that yeah. point. Well, go on, John. You go next. What have you... Uh... So I found three potentials, one of which was quite significantly under the five grand, but I thought was quite a, quite a nice car for money. Uh, mainly because I'm slightly biased. 
Oh, so uh, it's, a Volvo. it's a Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> I found uh, I found a Volvo 850 T5R oh, for yes. sale for three grand. Okay. Uh, in green, metallic green. So they came in three colours. They came in uh, black, green, and the all important yellow. So the yellow ones, you're not going to get them for three k. Yeah. It does look a little bit cheap at three k, so, um, and the, the picture's not very clear, so it might be slightly rusty. Um, it claims to be 270 horsepower, but doesn't list any modifications. So I think somebody's got uh, pub talk inflation on right. what it actually had from the factory, which is 235. So it's a private sale. It's a private, okay. yeah, it's a private sale. This is this was on eBay Motors, 134,000 miles, but with fresh ticket, uh, skin and wind, all the usual bits and pieces. Okay. Um, <laughs> the wife had just sent a message from the from the other room. Yes, there was I think one or two white T five Rs, but um, generally they're okay. green, black, and yellow. Thanks for being my own pedant. So, <laughs> is that your submission, or would you like to submit? I'm I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to stick okay. with it. It's under budget significantly, but I think it's quite cool. I did look at the the replacement, the V seventies, uh, and you can get a V seventy R, but they tend to be not as great. Then the the facelift the I think it's like a 2002-ish where they went to the they called the P80, um, which is the one that came in that lovely kind of turquoise colour. Mm. Those were what I was looking for because they're really really great. Uh, you can get them all-wheel drive, 300 horsepower, five-cylinder turbo estate, um, but they're talking kind of seven eight grand. I think that will be on par probably with the with the Merc that Greg chose. Yeah. yeah. But I just couldn't find one in budget. The cheapest was seven thousand. Really? Uh, yeah, so it's surprising that they're more expensive than a... Yeah. I'm sure if you look in the forums, you might find one at, at a reasonable price. But yeah, I had a couple of other BMW options which were average, but the T5R just stood out as something quite cool. So. That's cool. I'm going to put in a final curveball. Uh, it is being sold by a dealer, uh, but I'm not expecting this to win after uh, after Greg's put in his Merc. But I have a real soft spot for Subaru Legacies. Okay. Yeah, you ooh, see. Ooh, and ooh. for sale is a three liter R spec. That was one of my other oh, options. Yeah. Now yeah. you're talking. It's in silver. It's a 2004 model. Unfortunately, the advert from a dealer just says silver, four owners, 4995. I have no uh, information about the MOT or service you, history. You don't need it. The only one thing you need to know about that car flat six. Flat six. That's everything you need to know. 76,000 miles. It seems to be reasonably well spec, but you'd expect that from the uh, from the spec B anyway. It's got the full sunroof, sat nav, heated seats. But you're not buying it for any of that, are you? It's um, it, nice. it's just a little bit of a curveball where mm. I like the fact it's got a CD tape player combi. I think that's uh, probably a selling point. It dates point it very, very specifically. Yeah. Dodo now. Yeah, the sat nav with a proper bird's eye view there as well. But it's um, I just thought, and it's a manual. Uh, it, that's the other bit of the tiny. Yeah, really I, just, nice. I just thought that was a, a nice sort of little curveball there. Um, so, uh, anybody listening, if you want, uh, you know, a practical family estate car, I think, I think Martin, I, I, I'm going to go with Martin's as my favourite because see, yeah. uh, the AMG will make a lovely noise, but flat six and four wheel drive. There's definitely um, four very different cars there, isn't there? Is there any yeah. honourable mentions really about it, Freddie? Because I've got one honourable honourable mention. I, I've got again from Mercedes, and it was a two hundred Mercedes Benz two hundred TE. So this was an old K Reg, uh, mm. proper battle bus, loads of kit. One owner from new. It had only done one hundred and forty thousand miles. It looked immaculate, and you know perfectly well that is good for half a million miles. Astrotal, mm -hmm. and it just yeah. looked a big, comfortable barge. And that again yeah. is probably something that looked after. You're not really going to lose any money on. You know, that was about four and a half grand. Was that full dealer service history? One owner, yeah. a 200 uh, Mercedes, coming in a bit of a classic in its own right. I just thought that was an all. Uh, if you didn't it's, want the AMG power, you just want something to waft about. It's a nice, reliable investment, that. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of reliable investments, my honourable mention was not. Uh, my honourable mention was an Alpha 159 okay. uh, 2.4 I've been looking uh, at these JTVM yeah, that's but in a very nice sort of grey brown I don't know the official colour but someone out there will it's an honourable mention there so we probably won't post it but... it's like a mockery oh, I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, I might put a picture of that we'll go, the podcast is going to go on YouTube as well so for the bits on YouTube I'm going to overlay yeah. a few pictures you, I think but you, but you, I love sexy. the 159 I almost bought one because uh, I'm a bit of a sucker for Italian cars but Oh, do you think diesel puts it off? Would you not prefer the 2.2 JTS? Or? If it was the 1.9, I 
I would say yes, because that is just the generic sort of. I think it was well, it was a Fiat sort of engine, wasn't it? One point nine two liters, yeah. But the two point four, I'm quite happy that the two point four is something a little bit different. It's got a manual box on it. Was it quite similar um, to the two point four? Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm thinking it's something a little bit different. Yeah. Um, it's obviously got that nice sort of stitch leather that Alpha's yeah. always had. Yeah. So, um, interesting. so we've got four cylinders, five cylinders. Six cylinders and eight cylinders in the in, in the, the intro. That's so quite impressive. All are available for the low, low price of, of well, five, five thousand pounds, pounds. pounds. Or, or much less in some cases. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So I think we will put those all online um, around the table. Obviously, I know everyone's got their own personal preferences. Um, I think if it was me personally, I, I think I'd still probably go and buy Greg's Merc. Um, I'm, I'm, John, you've already said you quite like the idea of the Subaru. I think I probably, um, yeah. Oh, Greg's now showing us the 200 as well, but Ooh, that definitely. is a reliable battle bus, isn't it? It's, um, but we'll put them online, have a look, see what you think, um, which is probably an apt time to bring us uh, right back round to the beginning where we, we have basically ground the gears, we have uh, learnt all about our first cars. Uh, next week we will be back uh, talking uh, about... Uh, a various range of subjects uh, and another barge bingo so please uh, next week's barge bingo is looking very exciting and I've got so many suggestions already gearing to go if they're still for sale so um, I think that leads me to say thank you very much for tuning in to the first automotive anecdotes we're going to go and put the kettle on uh, yeah, right, and yeah. uh, debate what we've just debated live but in a lot more detail <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much Greg and Chris for joining us uh, today Welcome. and obviously John thank you for uh, being a fantastic host into your studio again. And, and you too Martin perfect thank you very much for tuning in we'll see you soon and don't forget to uh, search like subscribe Automotive Tales on all social media platforms love it goodbye thank you mm -hmm.